Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about um, LM observability um, with scale, scalability and privacy in mind, and kind of what I've seen in the field so far. Um, we've been building a open source project here that you can check out on GitHub. And uh, as always, we also appreciate a star. So if you're logged in, you want to start that repo, that'd be great. And then I'll share one more link. Um, I'm not really going to go through um, this um, in the um, uh, talk today, but if you want to check out a lot of the code that I'll be kind of talking about in the slides, um, you can check out this collab notebook as well. So that let's go in and get into the talk. Uh, my name is Sage Elliott. I work at Y Labs. Uh, we're on a mission to kind of prevent uh, AI failure and help monitor models in uh, production or before they get to production. So you can uh, find issues much faster and hopefully fix them, you know, before your users find them. Uh, we enable observability to detect data and ML issues. Um, and for about the last decade, I've worked in both software and hardware uh, with startups and agencies. And if you want to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's going to be also a good place to ask questions to me later. So if you find what I'm talking about interesting today and you have questions about it, uh, you can ping me there. I think I'm also in the Voxel uh, community Slack. So if you are in that community as well, I should be there as well. Um, and just a recap. So we're going to talk about monitoring large language models and some of the stuff that we see in uh, production today. Also, if you want to throw in the chat, if you're working with a large language model um, application or you're, or you're interested in it, let us know. I think it's interesting to hear about like what people are working on and maybe what issues uh, you've seen in the field. Uh, but to recap, I'm going to talk about uh, what is ML monitoring and AI observability real quick. Um, and we'll definitely tie this into large language models, but obviously it can be used with other models as well. Uh, we have a saying, we like to say bad data happens to good models. So no matter kind of how much evaluation and testing you do, when you put it in production, chances are you're going to see, you know, behavior or something's going to happen that you weren't expecting or that you weren't able to catch in your evaluation phase. So you might have heard or experienced things like data drift, where the input data to your model no longer really matches the distribution the model is trained on, and your model may not be behaving um, accordingly. So how do you monitor a ML application, whether it's a large language model or other ML models in production? Um, one, you know it's an ML application, so there's going to be points in your pipeline or you know where your model is getting data um, that you can imagine um, a change can occur. So at the bare minimum, I always like to have you know people start monitoring their applications by monitoring the inputs, the direct inputs to your model, um, and then the outputs from your model. And in the case of large language models, uh, a lot of times this is kind of the only thing you can really do. I mean, you can have other parts in your pipeline potentially where you could have data quality issues happen. But if you're using something like uh, GPT-3 that's hosted on OpenAI, uh, you can really you know monitor the prompts going in and the responses from your model. Um, and now that you know kind of where you want to monitor, so in this case for LMs, those responses and the outputs from your model, uh, you you want to pick a way of uh, uh, like what change you're, you're looking for. Um, so sometimes this can be you monitoring against um, your training data set. You might say, cool, this new data coming into my model, the distribution looks very different from my training data set. And in the case of LMs, you might actually have like a behavior standard that you expect on a um, a a kind of golden set of prompts or something like that. And if you change your system prompt for prompt engineering or you train a model and fine tune it on something, you could feed it that data and see how it's behaving. Uh, but a common way too is if you don't have a specific data set that you want to monitor against or compare a baseline against, you can use kind of a uh, rolling window or moving window. So you might look at the data for the past seven days 90 days, et cetera, see those trends in behavior there. And we'll and we'll see what those metrics actually look like in a second when we dive a little deeper into the LM use case here. Um, now that you know that the type of change you want to look for, um, you should establish how you want to measure that change. So again, this could be distribution distance. So get, if you're measuring um, your, your new data compared to your baseline data, uh, you might say, you know, if it changes a certain amount, uh, we should... Um, you know, flag this or kick off some sort of automated job in our ML ops pip pipeline. You might have missing values. And then with LMs, this could be things like uh, monitoring for jailbreak similarity. So are people trying to, um, you know, get your model to behave in ways that it shouldn't? Or uh, are people 
getting the responses they're expecting? Is the sentiment from your response incredibly negative? Um, these are all the a whole bunch of different metrics that you can choose to kind of monitor for LLMs. And it's going to depend on your use case, what uh, you probably want to pick here. But we do provide in Linkit, the open source project, a whole bunch of out of the box metrics. And then it's incredibly easy to add your own custom metrics. So now, um, real quick, and you can post in the chat. We'll see if uh, uh, a lot of people post here. Now that we've kind of recapped, or maybe you've learned about ML monitoring a little bit for the first time, who thinks it's a good idea to monitor model in production? And uh, you could just post in the chat maybe real quick. Yes, I think sounds like a good idea, right? So I did a talk, not the same talk, but a, uh, I asked these same questions in a big talk I was doing at a Google I.O. extended event. There was like over 200 people in the room, asked this question, you know, basically everyone raised their hand and said, yes, it sounds great. Obviously, we should be monitoring models in production. Things can go wrong. Uh, we want to make sure they're they're behaving the way we expect. And then I asked, um, who here is monitoring ML models? So does anyone here have models in production? And if so, uh, are you monitoring monitoring them? And when I asked this question in that in-person audience, you know, the 200 people had their hands up and then about only five people, I think, had their hands <laughs> when I asked this question. And I see... Um, other people might not see in the chat because I think they're just coming to the hosts and panelists, but a lot of people said they do think it's a good idea. Uh, but yeah, is anyone actually monitoring their models? I haven't seen anyone uh, say yes yet in the chat. So I think uh, it's a a, a growing um, kind of field and an expectation, I think, that a lot of uh, um, uh, monitoring is going to be applied to these ML models that are now going into product production. Especially now, a lot of people with LMs are putting models in production right away. Um, and it's interesting to talk about how they're monitoring them. Someone said, uh, monitoring in a way of watching and praying. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And some people like, and, and you might not always need a real-time monitoring system, depending on what your application is. Uh, maybe spot checking it is okay. Um, all right. So tying this back into large language models, uh, you're likely familiar with plenty of the LMs at this point. Uh, OpenAI, Transformers from uh, Hugging Face, uh, Dolly, which... Um, was Databricks LM, but now they are um, uh, probably using a lot of Mosaic models. And you've probably seen a lot of the applications like agents, chatbots, summarization, QA, et cetera. And again, if you're working on these, uh, let us know in the chat if you're working on any of these uh, specific app applications with LMs or maybe even what type of LM you're using. I think it'd be interesting to hear about. So what are the some, uh, some of the common pain points um, that we've been seeing with customers that we've been talking to and just talking with people in the field and personal projects or pro projects putting in production. And again, let me know in the chat if you've experienced any of these. Uh, you've probably seen hallucinations where you're getting back kind of ridiculous responses. Uh, sometimes it's not a true response at all. Um, sometimes I also get weird data. So um, I'll probably mention this again later, but having uh, your model generate a phone number or something, even though you never told it to do that, and then it's giving your your user the wrong data, like a phone number, and then they're going to get more mad if they were complaining about your product in a chat bot. And then it's like, oh, yeah, here, call this phone number. <laughs> and it just made it up. <laughs> and then it could actually be someone's real phone number, potentially. Um, prompt engineering. So almost everyone uh, does... Um, you know, some form of prompt engineering. And if you, again, if you're building an LM and you're doing prompt engineering where you're telling the model how to behave, so especially in the case of GPT 3.5, I know fine tuning, I think just came out uh, a week or two ago, but before that, uh, and for GPT 4, you basically change the behavior of the model using prompt engineering. So, you know, you have a system prompt and you're saying, hey, you know, you are a helpful chatbot, et cetera. You know, I expect these behaviors. Here's data for you to provide to customers. And a lot of people change this prompt over time, trying to improve the model. When I ask people how they're measuring those improvements, uh, a lot of the times they're just kind of like, well, you know, I change it and I think it's going to be better. And um, sometimes they might spot check like a set of prompts and see how it behaves on that. But if you're having this in production and you have like hundreds or thousands of users using it all the time, it's kind of hard to validate. Did that prompt actually make it better for someone or did it make it worse? Uh, did it make part of it better? Did it make part of it worse? Um, so I think that's a, a really interesting thing. And this is going to be the future of kind of prompt engineering is being able to monitor, you know, when you change a prompt, uh, how did it affect your model and potentially do like 10 versions or five versions of prompts and then monitor that over like a week period 
and see which one did the best and select the best one uh, from production data. I think that's going to be the future that we see of people doing with uh, prompt engineering. And then like uh, I mentioned, uh, output validation, where you might get like PII, uh, private information, or you know a credit card number or a phone number or something that it generated. This is kind of a big um, security issue right now, which I think is also going to be a really interesting field um, in the next several years, or if not longer, of like cybersecurity, but specifically around large language models. I mean, a lot of this can be um, caught or mitigated with some sort of validation. And we'll see uh, so how to do some of these things in a second with, with the open source library. Um, so how to solve these problems? So guardrails is a big thing, and you've probably seen models behaviors change over time. So if you use like GPT-4, and then, you know, there's been a lot of research papers and posts about how people saying it, you know, it's not as effective as it once was. And, uh, you know, I don't know what changes they did or anything, but a, a lot of the speculation is they've kind of added more and more guardrails to the model uh, to prevent behaviors that they don't want. Um, so these could be things like, again, monitoring for uh, prompt jailbreaks. So you can use something like a vector database and you know store a whole bunch of um, jailbreak prompts and then look at the new prompt coming into your model and calculate like a similarity score on it and then kind of say, hey, no, this looks like they're jailbreaking the model. You know, Don't even pass this to the model. Or if you do, uh, don't actually give the response back to the user. Um, categorical um, uh, 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 responses is a big one to look out for too. Like if you have a chat bot um, on your tax service, it probably shouldn't be giving you dating advice or medical advice. So you, you can kind of uh, use a, another model to classify like what does this response or prompt um, classify into. And again, I kind of mentioned security before, but monitoring for patterns like credit cards or private information or phone numbers, anything, detecting those patterns very qu quickly, or again, having that in a guardrail where um, if it gets detected, you just don't pass that response to users. The other evaluation, this is kind of where I talked about the the prompt engineering is a big piece and, and a, one of the biggest things I see people kind of start starting to adopt this more for is uh, doing those things like changing prompts or kind of shadow deploying prompts and seeing how they perform over time in production and then selecting that best one. Or potentially, I think there could be some really cool stuff around um, automatically making better prompts by looking at these um, features that were, again, we'll see what those uh, metrics look like, I think, in the next slide. But there's going to be metrics that we extract out of like prompts and responses, using those almost kind of as a fitting function potentially for making better prompts, which will be really interesting. And then um, you want kind of observability over time. So you might see like, what is the sentiment over time? That could be from prompts going into your model. It could be from responses in your model. You know, how readable are your responses? Um, are people getting more toxic with your model? It just gives you a really good insight to how your model is actually being adopted and used. Um, and you could kind of make adjustments uh, for that as you go. So how do we solve this at scale? And I'd, again, shared the link in the chat. If you want to go check out the GitHub repo, there's a lot of examples in there as well. Uh, but we have a open source library called Linkit. And it kind of fits into your ecosystem like this, where you have your prompts going in. It can really work with any large language model. As long as you can get access to the prompt and the response, you could either log one of those or you can log both of them. And it can just take it in the form of like a Python dictionary or in a data frame. Um, so you're going to get the prompts, you get the responses return. That goes into the language toolkit. And then we extract metrics from there that uh, can, can let you know like different things about text quality, sentiment, security, et cetera. Um, and it's open source, has already some integrations with the uh, most popular libraries like LangChain, et cetera, that makes it even easier to use. But it's already very easy to, to use out of the box again for basically um, any large language model in a Python environment. You just pip install the package and then bring in the, the prompt and response. So um, integrates with everything and it's just a few lines of code and then you can use it to kind of enforce policy for all those things we talked about like uh, quality PII leakage um, and measure for toxicity etc all the things we kind of already mentioned so it looks like something like this you get your prompt coming in we extract these metrics um, and then we do the same thing for the response so we have some out of the box metrics I think there's 33 in total um, like 16 for each prompt and response, and then also a response relevance. So we kind of calculate looking at embedding. So this, did this look like a good response or not? 
Um, and then it's very easy to add your own custom metrics. So, you know, monitoring LMs is kind of a new field. And we think a lot of these out of the box metrics give you really good insight. Uh, but if you want to bring a custom metric in, it's very easy. And again, you could tie that into something like a vector database. So if you want to look at similarity scores between any other data that you're kind of storing in there, you can get that really quickly, which is pretty awesome. Um, so some of the out of the box ones, you have response relevancy, has patterns. That's things like looking for credit card, phone numbers, et cetera. A lot of that's already out of the box. But again, you could add your own pattern matching in if you wanted. Um, sentiment, toxicity, jailbreak, similarity. Um, again, we have a little database that we have for this. But if you have a larger data set or things specific to your model, I'd recommend looking at making a custom metric for uh, um, for this probably with a vector database. Categories, difficult words, uh, reading score, and more. And because we're just extracting these metrics out, we're not really storing the raw data of the prompts or the responses here. Uh, these are also pri privacy preserving. So you're not really uh, in, in the lane kit profile. Uh, you're not storing raw data here. And this is built on, uh, the, the backbone of this is built on uh, Ylogs, our other open source library. And I'll talk a little bit about it a little bit later here. Um, and that does the same thing. So it just creates these statistical profiles of your data. Um, with extracted metrics. So if it was tabular, you could imagine having like the min, the max, the mean, et cetera. Um, it's a little bit more fancy than that. But um, none of your raw data is really living in these profiles. So this is a really cool uh, for any industry, but specifically also um, healthcare and finance uh, um, basically don't want to be moving their data or they're not allowed to move their data out of their environment. So these metrics get extracted in your environment and then uh, you can do whatever you want with these. So you might send them to some sort of observability store to monitor them over time. Um, it's really easy to use. So like I mentioned, you can just pip install it in your Python environment. And then it's just a few lines of code to create a profile. So here, um, and again, I shared the notebook. You can go look at it and run code if you want. But here we just import um, LLM metrics from Linkit. We import Y logs as Y. That's again, the, the logging library that I talked about. And then we just define a uh, um, uh, schema for our LM metrics. And so if we just run this by default, it's going to pull all those out of the box ones. We also have lighter weight ones. And then again, you can bring your custom ones in and I'll show you how to do that in a second. But then you just call y.log on that prompt and response, which again is just a dictionary of the prompt and response or a data frame, pass in that schema. And then you're going to get a profile that returns a whole bunch of columns. And we'll take a closer look in the next slide of this, uh, but it has all those metrics that we talked about. Um, if you want to write to um, our AI observability store for these profiles, um, it's just a couple more lines of code and you can write them up and then easily view these in a time series view um, where you can set up monitors on them. So you're saying if, you know, the sentiment or the response relevancy or anything like that drifted, drifted a certain amount, um, then, you know, send us an email, a Slack message or a trigger workflow in our uh, uh, ML ops environment. So just a quick look at what those metrics kind of look like. Uh, we have all the things I talked about, uh, like readability score, jailbreak, et cetera. But we get these for both the prompts and then basically all these again for the response. Um, accessing the metrics is really easy. So once you create a profile like this with Y logs, and again, you could do this not for just large language models, uh, but that's what we're looking at today. Uh, you can turn that uh, profile into dictionary and then do whatever you want with any of those metrics. So here's just like a quick example of making a function saying, you know, is this prompt not toxic, et cetera. We also have um, other functionalities built into the library that makes this a little bit easier to write validators for. But I just want to highlight that it's also extremely customizable. So once these metrics are in this profile, you can really do whatever you want with them, access them, uh, build your own functions and check. So in this case, this is saying if the toxicity is over 50%, you know, return uh, false, like it is toxic. And then you could say, actually, don't provide the response from our model because the prompt is very toxic. So you could, again, imagine doing this for jailbreaks is a, a big thing that a lot of people use this for right now. Custom metrics. So again, like I mentioned, it's really easy. Um, there's just a few more things that you would import here. And then you just really have a decorator around whatever function you want that could bring in the prompt here. And then in this case, it actually, this was an example I were, where I built out um, getting similar vectors from a vector database and then returning the distance. And so that's a good way of looking at like jailbreaks or any custom uh, metrics that you want to extract here. And then once you have that decorator in the function there, you just redefine your schema. 
by initializing the LLM metrics again after you've already called that. And then your new metric will be basically a column in here with um, all the ex all the kind of same distribution metrics that we're extracting. If it's numerical, but you can also provide um, categorical data. So you could just pass through a label basically saying, yes, it was toxic or not. Um, and then real quick on um, just like options for monitoring data and ML models and kind of why we do it the way we've done it with Ylogs and, and now with Lenkit. Um, Storing the full data set can be really costly to transfer, store, and analyze. Again, this depends on your data. Maybe it's not the case if you have a pretty small numerical set. Um, I've done a lot of work with computer vision in the past. And if you have done that, you might know moving a lot of images off some sort of edge device with a not good internet connection doesn't work so well or could be very costly if you have you know, a T-Mobile plan or something like that that you're doing it with. Uh, uniform random examples can um, you know, miss outliers in your data set. And then so what we do is... Um, we built Ylogs built um, is built on something called Apache Data Sketches, which allows us to kind of uh, get all these metrics on all of our data sets, and we can also merge them together. Um, so you can create uh, profiles at different time periods or from different data sets or in a distributed setting and actually merge them together and not really lose any fidelity there. And then you're not going to be missing any outliers, and they have a really, really lightweight profile um, that you can do anything you want with, and so you might want to you know, pass that profile off of an edge device or something like that, see what's going on, monitor for data drift. And if it did drift, then maybe you want to get a section of those images. So you can get all these metrics and then you can kind of tie tracing back to that data set. So if you do want to get that sample of data or anything like that, bring it into your MLOps pipeline. And then maybe you want to kick off a, kick off a job to um, do annotation and then retrain your model with those newly annotated images. Uh, there's definitely ways of doing that. It's just not stored in Y logs or y, um, uh, link it. And we have a whole blog post on this, and our engineer who did this uh, did a really cool talk on it as well, but talked about the scalability of Ylogs and how fast it can profile. So it used to be a little, quite a bit slower, as you can see, it still wasn't bad. Uh, but basically, with the way we built Ylogs, you can uh, profile um, up to two, 288 million rows and 43 columns in just uh, 3.5 minutes, which is insanely fast. It used to take uh, seven days. And just to kind of show how this would be in your MLOps pipeline, you'd be doing your you know, training and predictions, et cetera, here. And then you have your, uh, in our case, privacy preserving data statistics. Then we're passing that to some sort of platform or some sort of store for these profiles probably. And then having a way to trigger alerts and notifications. Um, if you're storing these over time, you probably have a nice dashboard view where you can look at reports and see what it looks like. And then also again, triggering workflows, which is uh, pretty important. And if you have a well-built MLOps pipeline, um, you know you can do a lot of really cool stuff around, oh, data drifted or something went bad. Let's go get that data. Uh, potentially either you know we're going to annotate as, as the data science team or ML engineer team, or we might kick off some sort of crowdsource annotation, uh, annotate that data, look at the ground truth of it, and then actually maybe use that new data to fine tune our model. And then you could even deploy that newly fine tuned model automatically out as like a shadow deployment see if it's actually performing well. And then if it is, then maybe you're the human in the loop of actually deploying that model. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do just with those metrics, like I talked about, of uh, getting insights as well. So if you did use our platform, um, you know it automatically breaks out like patterns here. And I, this is where I actually found out on a project I was building where my LM was providing a phone number. Because again, like I wasn't able to look at all of those responses out of like hundreds. Uh, but then there was one that was like, hey, there's a phone number here. And I was like, I never told it to give a phone number. And just by default, I was giving out a, a phone number that was fake, which uh, wouldn't have been really good in my case. Um, but we get all those things like, oh, it seems like there's a lot of negative sentiment happening in your prompts or in your responses, which definitely my response probably I I probably don't want unless I'm purposely making like a mean chatbot. <laughs> um, so this could be a really good flag for you to go look at. And then maybe again, just your adjust your uh, system prompt. And again, uh, just showing kind of what it can look like monitoring um, any profiles over time. You get those distribution metrics like we looked at, and then you could see like, oh, something dropped or went up. And then you could um, configure something like a monitor saying when there was a big distribution drift or it hit a threshold or below a threshold, you know, again, trigger some sort of job or an alert. And um, uh, I won't be doing a demo here, but again, I'll share these links. If you want to go check this out, um, please do. 
that's a little notebook that you can go run. And I'll just share a link to the GitHub repos as well. So there's LangKit where there's a lot of examples in there. And there's also um, Y logs. So if you want to check out the Y logs uh, data and ML logging library where you can do things like detect data drift on um, other language met- or other metrics, not just for large language models, uh, you can do so. And then also you can stay connected to me on LinkedIn. So I shared those in the chat. And I think there's a couple questions. So I will try to get to them. So when asked, what is data sketching? Um, I'm probably not the best person to give you a, a good detailed explanation, but it's a way of getting those aggregate statistics um, kind of in this format where um, if you were to look at this whole profile, which actually I might have up that you can kind of scroll through, um, it's basically a way of getting statistics, but uh, they're still kind of, I think, binned in a way where, again, they could be mergeable or broken out. Basically, like if you had a profile for each day, you can merge those together, get those um, st- statistics kind of together, but they're in a, a, a merge format where you can unmerge them. So it's a little bit more fancy than just doing like aggregate statistics in general, um, which is pretty cool. Someone said, can I explain how the reading score is constructed for understanding? Um, I think there's a model behind the scene and it is open source. So you can go check out the actual code and the model being used. I don't remember which one it is off the top of my head. Uh, but if you go look at um, these metrics and stuff that get calculated with Linkit, there's often like a model or a lightweight model or something constructed behind the scenes that we might be using. And um, then we get that score from it. So instead, when and where to use Linkit in an ML pipeline? for MLOps in production. So um, again, if you're just starting out, you can use this in multiple parts um, in your pipeline. When you're starting out, I just recommend if you don't know where to put this um, and you don't know exactly what data or anything you want to measure, um, look at the input and the output of your model. So again, for large language models too, that might be the only case you have sometimes where you're just going to be looking at the prompt going in and the response coming out. Um, So I'd stick it there in in your uh, pipeline, but you could also use this Uh, For instance, if you're doing transforms or cleaning your data anywhere in your pipeline, you could have it before and after. So we have people that use uh, Y logs and Y labs sometimes through um, multiple points in their pipeline, even just for data, maybe not even an ML ML pipeline, just a data pipeline and measuring for things like data quality or drift um, happening, uh, just kind of flowing through their entire pipeline. So you can really stick it anywhere you think that there might be a chance for something to change that you want to catch there. Thank you.